So, if you didn't already know, Dirty Civilian, Drew and I, and those around us, including Christian and Nick here behind the camera, we're all pretty invested in the firearms industry. And the firearms world has really made a deep dive for a couple of years into the guns themselves. We went from Glock 19s and all the cuts and modifications you have to do to them, to buying multiple ARs, and now we're all starting to branch out a little bit more into everything from comms, medical, night vision, and then transportation as well. And there's been a really big crossover as well with people who are overlanding. And overlanders, I mean, I don't know if you agree, but overlanders seem to be really into self-sufficiency, being able to leave their home with just what is in their truck and stay alive. And those guys are starting to find the firearms world and vice versa, but not a whole ton of people are talking about dirt bikes. Dirt bikes are incredibly versatile. And let me, let me put it this way. If you take the AR platform, you can have 308 DMRs that are kind of like those big diesel trucks. And then all the way down to 300 blackouts, those are kind of like e-bikes. And your 16 inch AR with an LPVO, that does a lot of things, but it doesn't do everything really well. Well, in my mind, a dirt bike is a lot like a 14.5 or a 13.7 with a suppressor and a stock, and it does a lot of things decently well, which means it has the capability to do most stuff. And I actually moved to Tennessee and had some dirt bikes, but this guy, Christian Guzman, has built out some pretty rad bikes, and he got me a lot more invested in this kind of stuff. Yeah, it's kind of interesting how that works. Uh, you know. Josh moved out here to Tennessee, and uh, he actually got me into bikes. And, you know, just the way my, my mind works or whatever, um, I like to full send a lot of stuff. And, you know, I just, I started thinking about how do dirt bikes apply to being a prepared civilian. And so I started building out this 250L. I went through a series of different bikes, um, but I think there's a lot of potential, a lot of hidden potential that isn't talked about when it comes to dirt bikes or two-wheeled vehicles in particular and how they pertain, pertain to being a prepared civilian. Yeah, I mean, and in my mind, being out in rural Tennessee at the moment, it's pretty easy to think, okay, well, it really only applies to people who have farm country to goof around and play in. And actually, I would argue almost the opposite because very narrow, tight spaces, uh, like in urban areas where you have sh smaller storage, if fuel starts to go short, um, you're probably trying to get out of the cities where there's chaos, you're trying to get further away. And if you only have a half a gallon of gas, this thing can take you a really long ways. So even if you are in an urban scenario, dirt bikes still have a lot of application. And hopefully in this video or some following ones, we'll be able to show you some more of what that looks like. But a point that you made, which I think is fantastic, is that this mimics a modern pack animal. It's kind of like uh, mules and horses. Where those could go, that's basically what we have right here. And I can't pick up and shift around or roll a vehicle like a car over a bunch of rocks if it does get stuck. It's difficult to do, but I can pick up this 230 and shift it around and move it, which is a big asset to this as well. My wife can ride it, she can roll it and move it too. So the, the versatility, we should just show them. Yeah. Let's go do it. So we just rode into the woods a little bit and we're starting to figure out that four people with camera equipment, with you know chest rigs and plate carriers and backpacks, tools to work on these bikes, being able to start a fire carrying food and water, it's pretty doable as long as everyone carries the gear that they need on their own. Which kind of takes us back to the point that Christian made earlier. These are modern pack animals in many ways. So Christian, in your life specifically, where do you see a modern pack animal, i.e. a dirt bike, being able to be used. Because I don't know about anyone else, but I have not ridden a horse and tried to do the cowboy thing, riding 
and trying to push cattle across, you know, half of America or trying to ford rivers with a horse. I haven't done that necessarily, but in regards to a dirt bike in the modern era, being that we sometimes go into the city, being that we live in a very rural part of the country, how do you see that fitting into your world? Well, I mean, a dirt bike isn't necessarily a perfect tool, but it will provide you a lot of capability. Um, there's a lot of use cases for these things. Maybe it's just for scouting locations. Maybe it's for search and rescue. These things can fit places that a lot of cars can't. And even, you know, maybe you just have one guy as a part of your group who has a bike and you send him to scout locations for ways that cars can get through. There's just a whole lot of application. There's a ton of potential here with dirt bikes in general. Yeah, and the fact that they save on fuel compared to a car means that, I mean, let's say that a tornado were to rip through the Nashville area, or if you live in the Pacific Northwest and the big earthquake happens and you're trying to figure out how do I get from point A to point B? Maybe I have a cabin in Idaho. Maybe I have um, a home or family that I, that I care very much about. And I'm trying to get from where I'm at right now to where I want to simply find and check on someone or something. Having a tool that is narrow, you can lift just by, with your own arms and legs. Um, and then again, using very little fuel means that, yeah, it's a good point. You can scout locations. Um, and you can find people and then maybe come back with a car now that you know the route. Probably be good to have a map or breadcrumb your way with the GPS, which yep. you have on your bike. There's mm -hmm. some pretty interesting things on your bike um, that, <laughs> that I don't have on mine. And some of those capabilities are pretty serious uh, tools that will change the platform, whatever the platform is that you're working with. Yep. Yeah, neither bike, neither of our bikes are wrong. Uh, right. They're built out differently. Josh, Josh's 230 is definitely more simple, mm -hmm. um, and he relies a lot on carrying things in a backpack. And you know, I don't necessarily want all that stuff on my back. I use my bike pretty much every single day as a work commuter, and so I want the ability to have everything I would normally keep in my truck, but maybe scaled down on the back of my bike. Yeah. And so it's pretty simple to just take basic backpacking logic and apply it to a bike. Yeah, yeah, Light, modern lightweight backpacking with a mule, so to speak, Yep. that runs on very little fuel. It's a game changer. Let's, uh, do, let's just take five minutes, let's pull your bike out and go through what tools you have applied to your bike itself to make it go a little bit further and help you survive a little bit longer with just whatever is on the bike. Sounds good. Cool. So when I bought this bike, it is a CRF 250L and it was pretty stock. So I've done a lot of things to this bike to make it work better for me and better work for the goal of preparedness and sustainment. Uh, kind of starting from the front, obviously I have a lot of stuff going on here. Um, I have a Garmin GPS and then I have a Garmin InReach Mini 2. Uh, the GPS is just for navigation. I, I believe it's pretty important to be able to navigate and you should probably be pretty well versed with paper maps as well, but this is just an easy solution that I can keep on the bike at all times. The InReach Mini 2 is just a communication device. It'll let me send an SOS signal if I ever get stuck somewhere or I get hurt or injured. Um, something to note, I usually don't keep it on the bike unless I'm riding around town. As soon as I hit any kind of trails or tight terrain, I clip it on my backpack. That way it stays with my body just in case I were to get lunged off the bike. Some other additions that I made were the Pro Taper handlebars. These are just gonna be more durable than stock, just in case I were to dump the bike, they're not gonna bend as easily. Um, I also went with RAM mounts for my phone, as well as the GPS stuff and my mirrors. And the nice thing about this is I can loosen this and bend my mirrors inward. This will allow me to ride through tight terrain without actually snagging anything. I also added uh, grip heaters and seat heater. Um, I actually get made fun of a lot for that, but the reason for that is um, it allows me to ride in a lot colder weather. Like I said earlier, I tend to ride this as like a daily driver, and sometimes when it's 25 degrees or below, um, this comes in handy. So that takes care of the front of the bike. The interesting stuff is located kind of towards the back of the bike. Um, I wanted something that I could store a full like sustainment kit in the back. So on this side, I have a full sleeping system with a tent, 
a sleeping bag, stuff like that. And this side I have all my cookware, so like a jet boil, um, a few fire starter tools, things like that. As far as the top goes, I have a scrim, just in case I actually want to hide the bike somewhere and leave it. And I have a camp camping chair because it's just nice to have a chair. Underneath that, there's another bag, and I keep a lot of tools and stuff in here. The nice thing about all of this is I can actually pull this stuff out because they're in individual dry bags, and I can throw it in a backpack. So I'm gonna go ahead and take some of this stuff off and show you guys what's actually inside each of these bags. So, I can take all of these and throw them in a backpack, uh, which is really nice. Um, it's something that can just stay on the back of the bike, and if I need to ditch the bike, I can throw on a big 40 or 50 liter backpack and just throw these in there and they'll stay dry. So, in this one, I have an Eno, I have a fire starter kit with some paracord, and I have a jet boil. Going into this bag, I have a sleeping pad. And in here, I have some more sleeping stuff like a sleeping bag. That pretty much does it for the stuff that I would throw in a backpack. As far as the things that I typically just keep on the bike, I just keep a ton of tools. So uh, these are tire spoons, just in case I have to change a tire on the fly. I have some wrenches some oil, a adjustable wrench, and a spare spark plug. You can pick and choose what items are gonna stay on the bike, and then you can leave some stuff there to work on the bike if need be, if you have to come back to it. But you can also then pick and choose, like I want my jet boil and my food cooking system, or I want a tent, a sleeping bag, and a pad, and I wanna go into town and sleep somewhere else and not have a big dirt bike you can kind of pick and choose what stays and what goes, and yep. it's all compact in that bag already. Yep. That's that's a pretty big deal. Yeah, so I, I mean, I I put a lot of thought into how I packed these. I wanted to make sure all of like the sustainment stuff itself kind of was dedicated to these two bags right here. Um, as far as everything else, this stuff can pretty much just stay on the bike at all times. As well as a scrim. This is just a large camouflage scrim. Um, my bike is already camouflaged a bit, but if I need to ditch the bike, leave it somewhere, leave it in the woods, maybe buried under some leaves, this is just another option that allows me to completely camouflage the bike and leave it. All of this stuff that you see here is gonna fit nicely into this Moscow Moto Reckless 40 system on the bike. Um, as far as the things that are in here, I might change, I might add some things or remove some things. It's not gonna look the same for everybody, um, I'm still working on it, so this is kind of like a work in progress. I mean, I would say it's nice that you can actually remove a tent if you're going into an urban area and add water or food. Because uh, in an urban area, you're gonna have structures and you don't need a, a sleep system that has a tent in there, depending on where it is that you're going. And I've gone a little bit of a different route. Um, the bike stays lightweight, but that comes at a cost too. So let me do a, a quick and dirty and show you guys what I have on my setup. So while Christian's setup is really nice and he has a bunch of tools and gear and some of the heavy stuff built into the bike and his suspension system, his tire and his engine is carrying a lot of that weight. This is probably not a way that I should go. I have a full ruck with a sleep system with food, water, tools, gear to keep me going and sustained. The problem is when I am up on top of the bike and I'm standing and I'm taking turns, that weight on the backpack is pulling me from the left and the right. It's pulling on my shoulders and sure, I can sit down and kind of let that bag sit on the tail end of the bike, but this is not ideal. I can do it for a short period of time, but it's not the setup. A better way to go would probably be to have a lighter rifle like his 300 Blackout, break it down and put it in the backpack and have a very minimalist setup. And I also, if I were to be taking this either into the woods or into an urban area, this bike is red, but it looks like someone's out playing and having a good time. And so what I could do is not have all this tactical gear on, not have a big chest rig, but instead have a flannel and hiking boots as opposed to tactical gear. So there are ways to go around having some of your setup 
blending into your environment, this ultimately is not the way to go as far as I can tell. I'd much rather do a Christian setup if I were trying to sustain for 24 hours. Get some of that weight off my back and simplify some of that gear. Well, we've talked about our bike setups, how we're carrying gear, and the fact that bikes can go a lot of places that other vehicles or people on foot can't. So let's, uh, let's throw some gear on, get our helmets all squared away, and demonstrate some of the performance that these bikes are able to give us with just a little bit of practice. through some tight spaces, there's probably gonna be a lot of stuff on the ground outside, and there's gonna be a lot of brush and twigs in the way that if you were carrying a big heavy pack, it starts to get pretty exhausting, keeping your ankles from getting tied up in this stuff. It's uneven, there's rocks under all these leaves, and it gets pretty rough. Even these small little twigs and sticks that get in the way, you're lifting your legs up over, and if you have a big heavy pack on, it gets exhausting and you're burning calories and you're wasting time just walking through space like this. And sure, if you had a vehicle like a big truck and you were flying down one of these trails, that's great, but you're still not gonna be able to get into kind of the, the depths of being outdoors. Whatever your terrain is, whatever weather you're looking at, if there's stuff on the ground, why not have a big engine with big old knobby tires to roll over this kind of stuff? Again, save you time and calories. It's gonna make a huge difference in the long run. So obviously if you were to be out in the woods, again, in an urban area, the suburbs, whatever it is, there can be downed debris. You can have buildings fall, you can have logs fall in the woods, whatever it may be, we wanna be able to get over, through, or past it. And this log hop is a pretty cool opportunity to kind of show, with a little experience, you can climb over stuff pretty easy. That's just a small log. But again, <laughs> yeah. If you have chunks of concrete, if you have downed buildings, or again, logs in the forest, you don't have to stop, get out of a forerunner or a truck, break out the chainsaw, and start cutting this thing up. You can climb right over it. And like we already said, get to a location where you are looking for someone or something find that location and then come back and get more help, whatever that may be. But it's pretty rad that these little vehicles are lightweight enough that they can just push through and climb over stuff like this. All right, we got a massive hill in front of us and obviously a dirt bike can get up it significantly faster. That's a no brainer. But how many calories am I gonna burn? We'll try to do the math on that once I get up it. What is my heart rate once I get to the top and how long does it actually take? Drew, are you ready? Yeah. Okay, you don't have me convinced, but we're doing it anyway. I'm All right, scared. I'm starting in five seconds. Four, three, two, one. Go. It took 120 to get up that hill as in a minute and 20 seconds. My heart rate was 99 at the highest. It's right now at 82. I'm glad I didn't try to do that with a pack. Oh, my quads. Uh, let's try it with a bike. Dude, that's a steep hill, that's rough. That took 30 seconds and I was in second. I actually was hanging my legs a little bit because that back wheel was getting squirrely a little. 
it was a steep hill, but heart rate was relatively low. I was not stressed, but was cautious about it. So yeah, heart rate stayed fairly low. It was about 70 once I got up here. And then it spiked once I got to the top because it was exciting and there was some adrenaline. But saved, saved like a whole minute, roughly. And uh, it was a lot easier to do. Sure, I burned some gas, but as far as getting up on top of that incline, that's way easier with the bike, no doubt. Well, at this point, maybe we've convinced you. We've been riding in wet weather and dry weather and big open areas in tight spaces. We've been talking about storing bikes in confined spaces. We've done a lot. We still haven't talked about if you're interested in buying a bike or fixing up what you may have already, what does that take? And what are some considerations that you should take into account before you go spend some money? So what do you say we, <laughs> we go rinse off the day, get some food, and then head back to the garage and talk about what you should consider when spending money on upgrading or acquiring one of these things. Let's do it, man. Okay, this has been a bruiser. So we've done a lot of riding and explaining, and by now maybe you're convinced that having a dirt bike somewhere in your repertoire fits your needs. And maybe you have some experience riding around on a family farm somewhere, or maybe you have no experience. Either way, I don't really know exactly what it is that I'm looking for if I was gonna go buy a brand new bike or even rebuild something that I have in my garage. And that's why this guy, Christian, is here. So Christian, we both have Hondas. Why Honda? So the reason I chose Honda was just due to the reliability. Obviously, it's pretty well known, like even with Honda cars, that they're just reliable. Um, pretty much all their bikes are gonna be fairly reliable. They, they offer a lot of different types of bikes. Um, Josh has a 230F, which is in the trail series of bikes, and I have a 250L, which is in the dual sport street legal side of things. Um, they're just reliable machines. Yeah. Well, and then there's also, you could go to a, a Kawasaki or a Husqvarna or even a Honda that's really high strung and it's really peppy. I mean, I don't know how, how else to explain it. Yeah. What's the difference between a race bike, let's say, uh, as opposed to something like a trail bike and why would you go this route? So, I mean, a race bike is going to be tailored for a specific role, um, typically for like motocross or supercross. Um, even enduro bikes can be pretty peppy right out of the box, and they're meant to be performance bikes. Um, that obviously comes with a pretty steep price tag as well. Mm. Um, but the other downside to a race bike, which is one of the reasons I didn't go with, you know, like a 250R or like a Husqvarna, is the maintenance cycle. Gotcha. Okay, so so in regards to these trail bikes that we have, or your L for riding on on and off roads, kind of a dual sport. What are we looking at as far as maintenance schedule goes between a race bike versus a trail bike? Yeah, so the bikes that we have back here, my bike and Josh's bike are gonna be slightly different as far as the maintenance schedule goes. Um, but both of those bikes are gonna be better as far as um, the maintenance intervals go versus like a Husqvarna or a KTM. Um, so. My bike has a maintenance interval of 8,000 miles, which is Dude, kind of insane. That's a, wow. And that's just due to the fact that Honda took the CBR 250 engine and they just threw it in a dirt bike chassis. So it's, it's tuned uh, to be just very reliable and have good gas mileage. Um, obviously, there's gonna be some downsides sure. with that as well, but. It's tuned for reliability and distance. Yes. Basically, so yep. it's, you can buy a bike that is designed for coming hot out of the gate and running red hot on RPMs, or you can buy a bike that's designed for consistency and running for a long time. Is that kind of what you're saying? Yep. Okay, cool. So let's say that you're looking at, um, 
I don't know, you're, you're going to buy a brand new car and you're, you're looking at a Toyota 4Runner. It's a common car and that car has 100,000 miles on it. Does that correlate to 100,000 miles on a dirt bike? Do, do those ratios kind of play out the exact same or is 100,000 miles on a 4Runner more like 10,000 miles on a bike? How do those pair up? I mean, I wouldn't really, I don't really know the exact ratio between the two, but it's definitely different. So like, um, bikes aren't really meant to go hundreds of thousands of miles. They, surely you can push it. Sure. Um, I've heard of instances where 250Ls, like what I have back here, have gone for 70,000 miles, which is a lot for a bike. Gotcha. Um, and if you think about it, it usually takes a lot longer to hit that kind of mileage on a bike, whether it be a dirt bike or a street legal bike or a dual sport. Um, so, I mean, you can probably expect, depending on what kind of bike you have, um, probably with these two bikes, uh, you can probably expect to go between 30 to 40,000 miles. So in regards to distance, we've been talking for a while now about how these take very little fuel. You can go longer distances on a gallon of gas but you've been riding to and from work with this 250L for a while now. How far are you actually able to take this bike on a full tank of gas? Yeah, so I've kind of found that I can take it about 100 miles on one tank of gas, which is two gallons. Um, Honda states in their spec sheet for this bike um, that it gets about 65 to 67 Sick. miles per gallon. Um, that might be true if you're you know, riding kind of conservatively, you're not like riding all over the place and going really high in the RPMs all the time. Um, again, it is a street bike engine, so it is kind of designed to have a pretty decent gas mileage. That's wild. Yeah, I mean, especially considering the fact that there are a lot of people, probably nearly every American home or garage has five gallons, two gallons of gas just sitting in their garage. And as long as it's preserved or it has a mixture or it's ethanol free, man, you could throw that in there and have a fresh topped off tank. And like you're saying, as long as you're running conservatively, you're gonna be able to take that a hundred miles roughly. That's pretty wild. Oh yeah. That's a huge force multiplier. So Christian, thank you very much for being here. Specialist Nicholas Jones, we appreciate you holding camera this whole time and for riding around a little bit with us as well. Christian, before we wrap up, any final thoughts for our viewers? Um, yeah, so owning a bike doesn't make you good at it. I'm certainly still working on being proficient with a bike. It's taking a lot of effort and a lot of time. Uh, it's just like guns and shooting. You, you have to spend a lot of time on them to get good at them. Um, but hopefully in this video, we've kind of showed you what they're capable of. And, you know, again, I'm not uh, a great dirt bike rider by any means, but you get somebody who's very skilled and they're gonna be able to take that thing a lot of places. Um, so what I recommend is if you do go buy a bike, go hit up like a local uh, motocross track or find some friends who have some experience on bikes, just ride around, have fun and get comfortable with it. Absolutely. Well, Christian, thank you very much. Appreciate your time, man.
through. This is not your problem because you have chickens, but they want $9 for freaking eggs at DG. 